way and new song. Sing to God all the earth. Sing to Yahweh, bless that name. Proclaim God's salvation day after day. Declare God's glory among all the nations, among all the peoples, God's wondrous deeds. Sing to Yahweh a new song. Sing to God all the earth. Heavens rejoice, and the earth be glad. Let the sea roar praise, and all that it holds. Let the fields exult, and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest shout for joy at the presence of Yahweh, who comes, who comes to judge the earth. God shall rule the world with justice, and judge the peoples with Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship today at Old Cambridge Baptist Church. It is good to be here with you this morning on the second of our Earth Sundays here with Doug Cook providing special music uh, around the themes of Earth and the creation. We also join on the Sunday uh, directly after the death of our dear sibling, Cynthia Shoemaker. Uh, and on the cover of your bulletin, you'll see a quilt square that Cynthia made uh, that was sent to me as a card from Renee Seal a couple of years ago. And after her death, and as I was preparing for this worship service, I thought about this card and what a perfect uh, visual image it is for the cover of a bulletin on Earth Sunday. Uh, and I direct your attention to page eight in your bulletin, where you can read what Cynthia said about this quilt square that she made for the Parkinson's quilt many years ago. So I hope you'll take some time to read that this morning as we remember Cynthia and hold uh, in prayerful uh, hearts all who loved her, who cared for her, including her children, Will and Molly, her whole congregation at First Church, the congregation here at OCBC, and her very special companions in Commonplace. I invite Catherine Harris to join now in leading us in the call to worship, which you can find on page two in your bulletin. Let us worship the God who shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. Let, Let us see, see the light in the land, land of God, God reflecting, refracting, and dancing on the river and across the street where the tree brings forth the fruit of life. Its leaves that come forth in the springtime will be for healing. The land cries out among us, for we have taken it and divided it, commodifying the air, the water, and the dust we are made from. As others are cut off from life, so are we cut off from your breath moving through us. And God, God shall wipe away every tear from our eyes. In lamentation, the water comes up and falls down our faces. Let, Let us follow our weeping and praise back, back to the source of our being. Good morning, friends. Our opening hymn 
God reigns o'er all the earth. you now to unmute yourselves and greet one another with those ancient Christian words saying may the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace, may the peace of Christ, Christ be with, Christ with, with everyone. 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 Peace of Christ from the Corvette. Good morning. With you all. Christ be with you. Like the back of your head. It's really nice. How do we are we? The back of your head is lovely. Carlos, peace to you. Ciao, Bo. Good morning. Lots of love to everyone. I love you. I miss Bye. you. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. 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 Oh, the look at that God baby. Donna. Look at that baby. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, that Everyone. was scary. We love peace. We love peace. Oh, thank you. Doug thank you. Cook. Oh, Anna Major, where are you? Hi, Doug yes, and Anna Major. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to mute you all now and uh, let you continue this time of greeting one another 
uh, as soon as the church service is over this morning, you'll have a lot of opportunity to gather together with one another and uh, have some conversation. Prepare now for the sermon, a second part of last Sunday's message. We began last week with an origin story forged in the midst of upheaval and devastation among a people in exile, a cosmic creation story in which every being from sun and moon and stars to the smallest microbe became part of a world in becoming. Now we come to apocalypse another type of creation story, drawing the whole of the cosmos into the unfolding drama. Like the Genesis origin story, John's apocalypse is also crisis literature, born not of exile, but of empire. Before we get into the text of Revelation, I want to be sure you understand that apocalyptic mythopoetic language is about understanding the time in which we are living and attending to the spaces we inhabit and which inhabit us. Apocalyptic is a planetary genre. And the question posed to an apocalyptic people is this, what is good to believe when life comes to a precipitous edge? Today, I invite you to become apocalyptic people, to understand the time in which we are living and dying, to wake up and join the cosmic drama unfolding, to consider what is good to believe and do when living at the edge. Between origins and edges, creation and apocalypse, the book begins. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I, John, your brother who shares with you in Jesus the persecution and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. We often imagine the apocalypse with images of fire. And those aren't images that we have outgrown with time. But these are not the only prescient images of apocalypse. It unfolds almost like a dream for John. How are your dreams lately? I was disturbed this week by a dream that I had in which nothing happened. I held my phone in my hand 
and helplessly scrolled through photos and stories and memes. It's what some nowadays call doom scrolling. It's a word that even Merriam-Webster is watching because it's become so commonplace. The tendency to continue to surf or scroll through bad news, even though that news is saddening, disheartening, or depressing without the ability to stop or step back. There's no better apocalyptic nightmare that I can imagine. All that death and destruction and decimation in the world on never ending loop, a spectacle of endings, a haunting of the world's ghosts held in the palm of your hand. And you, far enough away from most of it that it seems but a dream. The only interruption comes in the form of a targeted ad feeding back to you your own desires as a distraction from the doom and an invitation to come back into the capitalistic nightmare that created it. What does apocalypse look like? What does apocalypse sound like? What does apocalypse feel like? It may depend on your perspective and place in the world. After all, there is no the apocalypse, but a pluriformity of apocalyptic happenings. For the more than human, and for the human. For some, it has looked like ghostly white sails on the horizon, bringing not just colonial violence, but the unseen death of disease for many Native American tribes killing up to 90% of their communities. Apocalypse. For others that arrived, like an alien invasion, snatching bodies and transporting them to other worlds, performing unspeakable acts upon their flesh. Apocalypse. The human and the more than human worlds are entangled in each apocalypse as it unfolds. And in nearly every case, there is a question of empire at play for John of Patmos and for us. We talk about this as eschatology and reduce the whole affair to a matter of end times. But there's more to it than that. Micah Keel says, Revelation's eschatology is too often understood as chronological. We would do better to think of the future in terms that are spatial, not chronological. John of Patmos 
spends a lot of time describing spatial aspects of his vision, not too much on the temporal specification. He makes reference to stars and the sun and the moon, animals and plants. He insists that the entirety of the cosmos is integrated into God's salvation. Humans, plants, animals, mountains and stars are all in this together. So we might do better to talk about the eschatology as a study of edges rather than endings. The question is unmistakably spatial. As Kiel says, the future in Revelation is a space, a kingdom that cannot coexist with the human empire as it exists on earth. And some stories of coexistence become impossible to tell because the perspective necessary ceases to be as species become extinct and we can no longer know the world through the senses and activity and relational webs of that creature. Come back, you gods of old earth. Sun bear, moon bear, panda, polar, grizzly. Come back, you desert dwellers, bilby, potoroo, nail tail, bandicoot. Come back, you majestic singers, Texas gray, Japanese, southern rocky, timber wolf. Come back, dear mates, dear jackal wild dog, dingo. As loneliness descends and the spotlight grows larger, come back or take us with you, but leave us not alone without you forever. Come back. Deborah Bird Rose. Apocalyptic thought is emotional. Fear, anger, anguish are all part of the picture being shaped by John of Patmos and every people that have experienced an empire's reign squeezing the life from their lungs. And the point of getting apocalyptic isn't to work out those emotions in theory because there's no outlet in lived experience. It is to propel action galvanize commitment, shape life toward a counter narrative of or from destruction toward newness. That is the true aim of apocalypse after all, bringing about the new, not bringing an end to everything and in between a struggle. Adela Yarbo Collins looks at the text and says, the task of revelation was to overcome the unbearable tension perceived by the author between what was and what ought to have been. His purpose was to create that tension for readers unaware of it, to heighten it for those who felt it already, and then to overcome it in an act of literary imagination to create tension, not just to notice it, and to create something from the tension, becoming constructively apocalyptic. 
It's a question we should ask about religious practice and often, but we rarely do. We shy away from creating, content to tinker with the already existing, emphasize some aspect of the theological narratives we like and sweep a few others under the rug, but it's not enough. Not enough for us, not enough for the earth others, not enough to bring about the new. It's encapsulated eloquently in a phrase from Antonio Gramsci, the old is dying and the new cannot be born. Pope Francis in Laudato Si is concerned that eschatology may lead to inaction. But I think the Pope is mistaken. He's right about how we've read the apocalypse, but wrong about how apocalyptic thought and feeling and action can work for us. Purpose of revelation or any apocalypse is not to inform and to tell us all that is wrong in the world. It is to call for commitment to actions, attitudes, and feelings, not an attempt to report on events in a way that everyone can accept. It is perspectival, like a poem, presenting and interpreting aspects of reality, responding to it, and inviting hearers to share in a response. Claude Lévi-Strauss saw the purpose of myths in general, myths like apocalypse, to help us overcome contradiction, give us ways of making them appear less final, providing a number of ways of overcoming the contradistinction. All living beings are given a place in the cosmic drama of apocalypse. Even the animals in Revelation become of mythic size and importance, and trees and rivers and mountains become central features of the Revelation. Poetic perspectivalism of a multi-species variety. Revelation doesn't portray the human being removed from the planet, but pictures the earthly being transposed into the heavenly. But remember, in Revelation, heaven comes down. Humans do not go up. Listen to John of Patmos explain it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them. They will be God's people and God will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. The old is dying and the new cannot be born. And every being in the cosmos has a part in the struggle of becoming. Becoming apocalyptic people is about learning to listen to the language that earth others and cosmic creativity speaks. Trees are sanctuaries. Whoever knows how to speak to them, whoever knows how to listen to them, can learn the truth. They do not preach learning and precepts. They preach, undeterred by particulars, the ancient law of life. A longing to wonder tears my heart when I hear trees rustling in the wind at evening. If one listens to them silently for a long time, 
This longing reveals its kernel, its meaning. It is not so much a matter of escaping from one's suffering, though it may seem to be so. It is a longing for home, for a memory of the mother, for new metaphors for life. It leads home. Every path leads homeward. Every step is birth. Every step is death. Every grave is mother. So the tree rustles in the evening when we stand uneasy before our own childish thoughts. Trees have long thoughts, long breathing and restful, just as they have longer lives than ours. They are wiser than we are, as long as we do not listen to them. Herman Hesse. As Kiel says, Revelation tells us that the powers will fall. Indeed, that the working of their downfall has begun. Our current ecological crisis, he says, is an extension of the very same economic crisis perceived by John of Patmos 2,000 years ago, a system in which the rich and powerful consume obscene amounts and the vast number of poor struggle to survive. In a literal sense, the way John's book solves the problem is with the entire dismantling of civilization, indeed a whole world and a completely new creation. Profiling the drastic nature of John's remedy helps us understand the depth of his critique. If we don't get the diagnosis right to begin with, that the problem is structural, then we will never have the correct course of treatment. Many scholars think that John was writing to a persecuted people at the edges of life, struggling amidst the pressures of the empire applied to their lives. Others, though, think that John was writing to churches that had grown too comfortable within the embrace of empire. Stagnant. Hear that word, comfortable church of Cambridge, and your liberal enclave, with your devices in hand, with the death and doom of the world at your fingertips. Knowledge is never the point of apocalyptic thought and life. It is commitment to actions, attitudes, and feelings, not an attempt to report events in ways that everyone can accept. It is perspectival of a multi-species type like a poem, presenting and interpreting aspects of reality, responding to it and inviting others to share in a response. And the question remains, what is good to believe and to do when living life at the edge? That is the question of apocalypse, another type of creation story drawing the whole of the cosmos into the unfolding drama. Crisis literature, born not of exile, but of empire. Where is divine creativity at work in the world? How do we join there? What wisdom is spoken into the struggle from multi-species and cosmic companions entangled in the dying of the old and the struggle of new life being born?
And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship God. They will see God's face, and God's name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let everyone who hears say, Come. And let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. Our sermon hymn this morning, We Cannot Own the Sunlit Sky. Uh... 
Beloved of God, it is good to be worshiping with you. If you're joining OCBC Worship for the first time, either via Zoom or Facebook Live, or if you are relatively new to the life and mission of OCBC, we would like to know who you are, where you're joining from, and would like to know how we can connect with you and provide you with information about our various ministries. Uh, I, inv I invite you now to take this time to open the link to the connection card provided in your bulletin, and also you will find that link in the chat box. Also, if you would like to share prayers that is on your heart to Pastor Cody and to the congregational care team, you are invited to open the link to the prayer request form. And you are invited to indicate if you would like your name and prayer to be listed in the bulletin. You can either open those links now or see later after. I now invite us uh, in our community time of prayer. We now enter a time of prayer, coming together as a congregation. The singing bowls will lead us into the time. After some minutes, Cody will have a special celebration and presentation. Then I will offer a prayer for the congregation and open the time of communal prayer through the chat box. After more time of silent prayer, we will pray the prayer of our brother Jesus. Tuning our hearts to the spirit, let us pray. to make a 
special uh, celebratory uh, prayer this morning, uh, both the acknowledgement again of a birth into the life of this community, uh, the birth of Lucas, Lucas Robert de la Plaine Looker, who was born on March 20th uh, and adopted by Sarah de la Plaine and Adam Looker, who are here uh, this morning with us in the service. Uh, and we want to present them on behalf of the congregation, uh, this Bible with Lucas's name and birth date on it and a sheep. Uh, and also to acknowledge that the choir, which uh, Sarah has been a part of for some years now, also collected a substantial uh, gift to give in Lucas's honor to the Sunny Meadow Animal Sanctuary, which is a very special place to Sarah and Adam. And in addition to this celebration and gift of a Bible and gift of care to animal companions, I want to invite Martha Collins to come and share a special poem that she has written on this occasion. Martha, would you come and share with us? This poem is a villanelle, a poetic form that repeats in a very patterned way, not only rhymes, but also whole lines or parts of lines. Welcome Villanelle, Lucas Robert de la Plaine Looker, March 20th, 2021. Sarah, Adam, Lucas, three are home where there were two before. Welcome baby, soon to be a talker, walker. What will he be saying? What will he explore? Sarah and Adam's Luke at three. Will he draw like Sarah what he sees, sing, then learn to read a score? No more a baby, soon he'll be studying maybe chemistry like Adam, happy father for Lucas, his family's number three. For now at OCBC, we promise to pray for, love, adore this baby Lucas, soon to be a member of, of our family. Church school, choir, whatever more, Lucas, born in March, month three, may wish to do, may grow to be. For the birth of Lucas, for the love of Sarah and Adam, and for the embrace of the congregation of OCBC around this family of three, we give our deepest thanks, saying, loving God, we praise you. God of breath, wind, and life, we are thankful for the gift of new life today, God, created in your image. Help us to celebrate this life among us as we notice you within each of us, within our gentle laughs, our emotional tears, our caring spirits, and curious minds. Give us grace as we recognize the breath in all of us. We are thankful, God, for the wind, the wind that helps flowers to dance, dirt to fly, and the sea to foam. The same holy wind that knocks us off our feet into action. Displace us with this wind, God, from the same old, same old. Move us to stand with your creation and those most affected by its destruction. Forgive us when we sin against your creation, for we know what we are doing. But God, give us grace to notice this wind of reminder when it is howling or whispering. Restore life in us 
around us and through us. A life that is joyful, a life that is full of empathy, and a life that feels our depth of sorrows. Help us to join with this life in all of your creation, God. We pray for the life around us that has been taken. We pray for the life within us that is hurting. We pray for the healing of life in our world. God, hear the prayers of our hearts that we share with each other now. God, you hear our prayers written and unwritten today. We are grateful that your son, Jesus, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue to worship by bringing our tithes and offerings for the ministry and mission of this beloved church. Uh, if you are giving online, please go to oldcambridgebaptist.org. That will take you to OCBC page. Uh, click on the button and it will direct you to the donation page. And if you are giving via check, please indicate the ministry and or the mission you're making the contribution to in the memo line. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for gathering your people and for this opportunity to offer a portion from the blessings we have received. Bless these gifts for the ministry and mission of your beloved church, and may we always remember the poor. With thanksgiving, we pray. Amen.
please join us for the doxology. good day to be together here in this virtual space. I, I want to draw your attention to a few invitations to community and service in the bulletin and then ask you to look it over for all the other things that are listed there. We're coming to the end of April, so if you haven't yet given your April communion offering and intend to do so, uh, please do that uh, this week. That uh, Offering goes to Green Roots and Alternatives for Community and Environment, two groups working at the intersection of environmental and racial justice uh, that we have been uh, forging partnerships and relationships with. I also want to note on page 11, there are several opportunities there to engage at this intersection of racial justice and earth justice at the top of the social justice opportunities box. And then also to be sure you know, you are always invited into the Wednesday evening space uh, that we hold here on Zoom at 6.45 each Wednesday. Uh, and in April, these are all prayer gatherings. And in May, we will turn our attention to a variety of groups that we are forming relationships with that are doing really great work around communities responding to extreme weather, uh, LGBTQI, um, uh, asylum seekers, uh, the Sunrise Movement in Boston, and then Finally, Asian American and Pacific Islander history and experience. It's gonna be a really great lineup in May on Wednesday evening, so mark your calendar for those. I also want to note that uh, at this point, we don't know uh, when a memorial service will be held for Cynthia Shoemaker. Uh, it will be at First Church Cambridge UCC when it does happen, and we will get that information to you as soon as uh, we know what that is. And it will probably be uh, a matter of weeks or even months. Uh, so don't, don't look for that this week, but do look for that when we uh, get that information. I want to thank Doug Cook for his incredible music that he uh, composed uh, and brought into the service this morning. Thank you, Doug. Uh, beautiful music, uh, a book ending a week of theological, poetic, musical explorations of our relationship with the larger web of life. Uh, with Linda Chase last week, Doug Cook this week, uh, it has been a really beautiful uh, earth week. I invite you now into the singing of our closing hymn, The Peace of the Earth. You can find the uh, words to that hymn on page eight in your bulletins.
Go now, beloved of God, to be diligent doers of justice and fierce lovers of mercy, and to walk humbly as citizens of God's cosmos. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.